Yeah, I'm okay. 
reception. Third down, just inside the numbers coming out.
throughout the 1950s, but by 1969, more than 500,000 U.S. military personnel were stationed in Vietnam. It's estimated that as many as two million civilians from the North and South died, along with some 1.1 million South Vietnamese and Viet Cong fighters. The U.S. military has estimated that between 200,000 and 250,000 South Vietnamese soldiers died in the war and 58,000 U.S. armed forces died in the Vietnam War. There was, in 1970, an anti-war movement where hundreds of thousands of protesters clogged city streets and shot down college campuses. The government responded by shooting to death four students at Kent State, and 10 days later, two black protesters at Mississippi Jackson State University. The history of the Chicano movement. In February 28th of 1970, Rosalio Munoz organized a march to protest the high number of Mexican-Americans dying in Vietnam in L.A. In spite of pouring rain, 5,000 people turned out to that march. In July of 1970, several months before the L.A. moratorium, a march was organized in Houston, Texas, drawing more than 5,000 people here in San Diego, there was a march. So it was many of many anti-war marches that were taking place in Chicano communities throughout the Southwest. The moratorium, I remember August 29, 1970. It was a very hot day. Three other persons and myself drove to LA. 1,000 people, from San Diego attended to moratorium. We got to LA and I witnessed something I had never witnessed before in my life. I saw thousands and thousands of Chicanos participating to demonstrate in a march from California, no Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, you know, the Midwest, from Mexico, from Chicago, and they were all getting ready. I remember the march started late, 
But then people got behind banners of the Virgen de Guadalupe, Mapa banners, Bramboray banners, Ufwak banners, and we started marching for five miles. People came out from the street, yelling encouragement, a lot of them joined in, and then we got to the park. At the park, I remember we sat down, and I remember one of my friends saying, why don't we go to that liquor store over there and get a six pack before the speakers and the band start playing. So I remember we walked into this liquor store, and I'll be honest with you, a lot of people were passing out six packs, you know. But that was, like they stated, a block or two blocks away. And I remember when we came out, I told my friend, I said, look, look at all those cops' cars over there, like 50 or 100 cop cars. He said, oh, they're probably just monitoring. So we sat down, and then we heard a commotion. And I remember getting on a chain link fence, because it was a chain link fence, like a tennis court or what have you. And I looked back, and I could see the brown berets going up to the cops, hey, everything's okay. And boom, boom, the cops started putting a baton to them. And in around three minutes, the word went down. The people in front had no idea what was going on. 30,000 people is a lot of people. And in three minutes, five minutes, the bright sky got dark from all the rocks, bricks, uh, sticks, trash cans, and I don't know what else that people were throwing at the police. It's like a friend told me, it was like 1940, the Zoot Suit Riots, all over again. And I remember the police would be pushed back. And I remember individuals guys going up to the cops and just one good punch before they got Billy Club down. And I remember the cops started, more police started coming in and they started lining up. And I kept saying, why are they, why aren't they going in? And then a little while later, I realized why they weren't going in. They were waiting for the wind to get a direction on how the wind was blowing for the tear gas. And I remember three feet from me, a tear gas canister landing. I had never smelled tear gas. And let me tell you something. In two seconds, it makes you say uncle. But people kept fighting. They kept coming. I remember there was a little side street where the, the front of the, the stand was. And people from the little neighborhood, it was only a half block going into Whittier, had the hoses out and were letting people wash their eyes out from the tear gas. Mothers were holding their kids, crying. Everybody's trying to get out. And I remember when I got to Whittier, after we got all our people together, because we didn't know where we were at. <laughs> we, we walked for five miles. We didn't know which direction or anything else. So when we got to Whittier Boulevard, I remember seeing a cop car go by, and probably with 100 feet, that car was totally demolished, totally. So we started walking where, I don't know, down Whittier Boulevard, and cops were coming out with their, hand, with their guns and shooting up into the air and pointing it at the people. At that time, this guy with a flatbed truck came by and says, hey, you guys need a ride? We all jumped on top of the truck. And I told him, take us to Pico Boulevard. Because Bert Corona and Abe Tapia had told me that they were gonna hold a press conference at the Mapa State Headquarters. So we went back there. We held a press conference. At the time, there was an individual a lot of you might remember him, a Chicano who ran for governor, state of California, Ricardo Romo, and he had gotten hit. And I always remember, it's 46 years ago, I can tell the story now. 
I always remember Bert telling him, don't forget, you got hit with a tear gas canister. You understand? When the news media shows up, you tell them that. So Bert and Abe denounced the police riot against the Chicano community, and called for an end to the war in Vietnam. And I remember leaving LA, East LA around 6 p.m., getting on the freeway, and I looked back, and East LA was burning. It was burning. So I, I remember getting home around 9 p.m., and Channel 10 called me and said, can you do an interview on 94, where Channel 10 is at? So I went down there, and I also stated that the police, again, had attacked a peaceful protest that supposedly was guaranteed under the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and that it was a police riot, and that they had murdered Ruben Salazar, Diaz, and Ward. So that's what happened, what I recall, on August 29, 1970. So today, 46 years later, the question is, what has changed? Tell me, what has changed? A thousand people from San Diego attended. Now, I cannot believe that they're that old not to be here tonight. Ruben Salazar, Diaz and Ward gave their lives that day so we could be here today. So. The biggest problem confronting us in 2016 is not immigration, it's, it's not police brutality, it's not education, it's not incompetent, unresponsive politicians. The biggest problem we have is we have no power. We have 60 million people and we are not organized. So. We look around, yeah, some things have changed, unfortunately, for individuals, but not for the masses of our people. We still are at the bottom. So, what's the historical lessons from Vietnam, from the, the anti-war moratorium against the war in Vietnam? To me, it was a defining moment in my personal and my political life. To persons, all persons of Mexican ancestry, the demonstration provided a valuable political lesson. We learned that problems such as the Vietnam War could be confronted and addressed through our own self-determination. Nobody financed the anti-war moratorium. It came out of the community, it came out of our people, out of our own self-determination. You know, we also must remember, like I stated, all the people that have gone before us. Carlos was telling me that Corky Gonzalez's ashes are right here, right here. Corky, in 1970, was arrested in the L.A. moratorium and went to jail for 60 days. So we must never forget those type of sacrifices. Now, the, the other lesson is on August 29th, here in San Diego and throughout Aslan, we are going to commemorate the 46th Chicano moratorium. On that day, Chicanos will remember and remind today's generation. I saw those little kids playing out there. They are going to be the future. They are going to make what we're talking about become a reality if we do our job. So to remind that generation that needed change will occur only if we build on history and go forth with the same espirito, sacrifice, and struggle as their predecessors did in 1970. I want to leave you with one last 
word, one last message. Without struggle, there is no progress. Gracias y que viva la raza. With our memorial to those who have fallen. Those ribbons represent have names of people that have fallen throughout the year, throughout a you know, long time ago, contemporary yeah. and present. There are names around. I'll see you, bro. Very good. Apologies, I forgot. Okay, bro. Awesome. Carlos, I gotta run, okay? Okay. Okay, okay. okay. Good to see you. Tommy. Bye. Keep oh, it up, okay? Thank you. Okay, gracias. Eh? See you later. David. Okay, brother. Great words, brother. Great words. Yeah, he just wants a mic. <laughs> I was I was listening for you to um, El Plan de Aslan, El Plan de Aslan. You forgot to mention it. <laughs> There's That's so the many way. things. You, you know. When you get a chance, call my mom. If, oh, uh, okay. 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 Or, and give her your phone number. Okay, okay. we'll do it. Okay, come. Ready? Hold it. That was really. Huh? Yeah, we're gonna go. Yeah, the, the baby's sick, you know. Oh, you can go. I want Erica to answer that. Yeah. Still tell Jim O'Pangalaria. Presente. Michael Schnorr. Presente. Ricardo Falcón. Presente. Ricardo Favela. Presente. Michelle Cerros. Presente. Reyes Lopez Tijerina. Presente. Antigono. Presente. Rene Nunez. Presente. Jesus Luna. Presente. Leroy Allen. Presente. Presente.